We see disasters on television all the time. Earthquakes. Tornadoes. Hurricanes. But the cameras stay for only a few days. What happens months, even years, after those disasters have occurred? We'll talk about that next on Global Perspectives. This program is made possible, in part, by funding from the UCF Global Perspectives Office, the Global Connections Foundation, and the India Center at UCF. This is Global Perspectives with Pulitzer Prize winning commentator John Bercia, Special Assistant to the President for Global Perspectives at the University of Central Florida. Hello and welcome to Global Perspectives. What happens when disaster strikes, whether the location is New Orleans or Fukushima, Japan? Is it possible to envision recovery? New Orleans suffered from what has been called the most expensive and destructive natural disaster in the history of the United States. Fukushima was caught in the middle of a nuclear nightmare after an earthquake and tsunami struck. Today's guest, disasterologist Jed Horn, has had a front row seat to these types of unfolding dramas. He personally lived through Katrina, working for the Pulitzer Prize winning Times-Picayune, which, despite overwhelming obstacles, continued to function and serve as a primary news source during the crisis. Horn tells the story in his book, Breach of Faith, Hurricane Katrina and the near death of a great American city. Horn also served as an advisor to the National Oil Spill Commission and has participated in multiple disasterology discussions in Japan. Hello and welcome to the show, Mr. Horn. Well, it's my pleasure to be here, Mr. Brazier. Tell us about Katrina. It captivated everyone's imagination as it was occurring. It still is a fascinating topic. What was it like when you first started to experience the Katrina catastrophe? Well, the remarkable thing about a disaster is that it is, by definition, completely unpredictable. And there was more kind of surrealism thrown in my face in a matter of a day or two than I expected in a lifetime, ranging from being held at gunpoint by evacuees, nervous that I had come to roust them from the home that they were living in, to the kinds of shocks and surprise that just come in trying to put out a newspaper on a cardboard table in a, a, a strip mall in Baton Rouge, 70 miles from our usual press. Did you ever feel unable to cope with some of the scope that you were dealing with? Um, at all times. At all Entirely times. and completely, yeah. It was one of those things. It's, it's seat of the pants uh, journalism. It was seat of the pants living at that time. Um, and one, one adapts, one accommodates to those kinds of, uh, of pressures. But it was at all times, I hasten to say, um, intensely stimulating. I think for all of us in the newspaper business, it was a peak experience. We won't uh, I can say I hope, but I also uh, fear we won't match that level of excitement again in our careers. I've yeah. done some war reporting. It's less thrilling than that in the sense that you're fighting in a recovery mode from a disaster for your own home, your own backyard, which makes it that much more compelling. You mentioned the gun incident. Were there other situations where you were in serious danger? Well, I think there were some I didn't realize at the time. Uh, the, probably the single stupidest thing I did during this whole disaster was to get in my car on the Tuesday night, a day after the storm struck, thinking it was now time to investigate what was left of my home. And proposing, and in fact driving, uh, what is usually a two-hour trip to this home in, in, in southern Mississippi, five hours later arriving, having pressed on against semis that were overturned in the road, wires that had fallen into the street, the, the highway lanes themselves had cut over onto the uh, median strips, the neutral grounds. Nobody in their right mind would have done that knowing what was ahead, but uh, there were those kinds of adventures at every turn. So various of my staff uh, wound up in far greater danger than I ever courted because I <clears throat> hung back for the most part in Baton Rouge to direct the staff while they, uh, of course, were in the eye of it uh, down in New Orleans, working in a city that had been reduced essentially to anarchy. There was, until we got the Army, uh, the National Guard in there, it was a very perilous situation with looting and all manner of, uh, of uh, dangers of that sort. Mm -hmm. 
One of the most frustrating parts of dealing with disasters, both for the victims and for the people watching, is learning as time goes by of all the mistakes that occurred, whether it was Katrina or the recent uh, cruise ship accident in the Mediterranean. Uh, as more and more information comes out, you can't help but become angrier. You do. And as I would propose uh, and have proposed in some of these kinds of post-Katrina conversations, the blame game, while easily faulted and criticized, is actually a necessary part of the recuperative process in any community. You need to learn how to focus um, your disenchantment, your, your, your paranoia in some cases, socially, uh, all, all manner of urban myths uh, crop up out of, uh, out of the swamps of South Louisiana. One of them, the most persistent, being that the levee breaches were deliberately caused by the uptown elite which is, of course, the code for the rich white folks, in order to drive out a population, low-income black population, that was seen as burdensome to the, uh, to the city. That's uh, an urban myth that's easily refuted, but it has not gone away. Um, in point of fact, the levy breaches were so numerous and, uh, and uh, disastrous that they required the Army Corps incompetency that resulted in those breaches required no assistance from, you know, a, a white folk, racist or otherwise. And um, nonetheless, the need to believe that kind of thing, the need for the, uh, the government sector to blame Bush, to blame Governor Blanco, for example, um, is, is um, irrepressible. And it is a way of focusing what then becomes, I think, a more intelligent conversation about strategies for recovery. Once you're done with the blame game, however therapeutic, however cathartic, you then need to look beyond the disaster. And my perspective on that is that uh, you really need, we need as a society increasingly exposed to disaster to anticipate it more fully and to look beyond it for strategies of recovery and for ways to exploit the extreme uh, hazard that we've run in order to mitigate future occurrence of it. I notice here in Florida, for example, there's a wonderful program, or at least the, the, the seeds of one, in the decision made, um, I think, recently to require that utilities, the next go round, the next time the grid is shredded, that they actually price and keep careful track of what it would cost to, to go underground with the rebuild rather than just continuing repetitively to replace overhead wiring. Right now, the calculus is it costs 10 times as much to go underground. We're never going to do it. I think the assumption made by those who promoted this, this mandate to the utilities is that if you actually factor in repetitive laws, you may discover that you were smart to go underground here and now. And those, that's the kind of foresight that I think uh, is needed, certainly in Louisiana, I see a little of it in California, where they've begun to live with an awareness of repetitive earthquakes. Mm -hmm. And they've begun to strategize ways in which to, to bring emergency response together more coherently, but also to look beyond it and to quarantine areas that might not best be rebuilt because they simply are so vulnerable seismically, and to, um, in other ways, power forward the recovery that they know they're going to have to make next time they get a big shake. You've had a long and illustrious career as a journalist in various incarnations. You've reported on the domestic side. You've reported overseas. Um, but did you set out to become a disasterologist? I did not. No. <laughs> Disasterology, when there is such a word, uh, is really um, an outgrowth of what I certainly was not in any mood to ignore, could not have ignored, which was reporting day-to-day, -day, grassroots level on Katrina. But as I began to try to educate myself a little bit about what the city's prospects were for recovery. I found myself traveling um, internationally in some cases, certainly taking cognizance of other disasters. I sent a team out actually immediately after Katrina to look at what had happened in, in Homestead in 92 after Andrew and to look at the Charleston earthquake that had struck South Carolina. Um, we studied the Galveston quake, uh, uh, earthquake, uh, hurricane back in 1900, I think it was, San Francisco, 1906. I took my own self to uh, Kobe, Japan, which had had an earthquake that interested me because it had devastated a city comparable in size to New Orleans, a port, as it happened, like New Orleans, 
um, a first world city. New Orleans almost qualifies as a first world city, although there be, might be some dispute. And they had had their disaster 10 years prior to Katrina almost to the day. I was able to go there in, in 2005, really not many weeks after Katrina, and begin to understand what had worked there, what hadn't worked there, and to fine tune my understanding and to try to share with readers an understanding of how these things play out, what you can expect, and what particularly what kinds of mistakes you want to avoid making. Mm -hmm. And what, was that your initial experience in Japan? That was, in fact, my first trip over there. And what I discovered very happily and interestingly for myself was a community of disasterologists. One of the ways that, uh, that Kobe processed its calamity was to build a museum and, more importantly, a research facility having to do with uh, earthquakes and other disasters, actually, because they've begun to bring in people. I've met there with people from Bangladesh, where, you know, the sort of tsunamis and that kind of thing are the threat. Um, I've dealt with Australians there, where firestorms coming in off the plain can erase an entire city, you know, or substantial uh, coastal settlement. And we learn from each other, um, in, in, and there are very interesting commonalities that uh, that help. One thing I've discovered, there's a lot of noise in New Orleans immediately after Katrina as to whether we should um, do things like rebuild the Superdome, for example. There was a lot of agitation. What, you know, you've got hundreds of, uh, well, tens of thousands of people uh, homeless, 200,000 houses destroyed, uh, homesteads, uh, uni residences, uh, units of, of, of occupancy, and you're going to put $100 million into a a rock venue and a sports stadium it seemed kind of crazy. By analogy, we came to understand that these marquee projects, as I call them, actually are a very galvanizing way to focus and, and, and rearm a city uh, that has lost hope, lost its sense of possibility. We saw the same thing in, in, uh, in Indonesia after the Banda Aceh tsunami that killed 200,000 people. They decided to of all things, build a highway through the mountains of Banda Aceh. Um, it was seen very quickly as a beacon of possible economic revival. And in fact, although it's been fraught with problems and both of an engineering and a legal kind, it remains a kind of standard overhead which the, uh, the local people can, can respond to. Same thing really at uh, Ground Zero in New York where the kind of almost perverse decision to build another very high profile tower exactly in the footprint of the other one that was knocked down by the, uh, the terrorists might have been seen as, as madness. I mean, why would you want to put this lightning rod up to attract another strike? But it was very important, I think, for New York to regain its sense of responsibility, of, of opportunity, of, of stature in a world where terrorism, after all, is kind of unavoidable. Have you encountered situations in which you had difficulty envisioning recovery? Absolutely, yeah. I think, I think all of us went through a period in the storm's immediate aftermath, not, not, not within days of it, but within a couple of months of thinking, this city is a goner. You know, we're not getting intelligent responses out of Washington. There's all manner of, of fighting and squabbling at the local level politically. Uh, that urban myth that I mentioned made for racial fractiousness, needless to say. And there was no, uh, there was no economic uh, indication that we were going to see the, the rejuvenation that many people hoped for and others warned against. Interestingly, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Naomi Klein, for example. She sees in disaster, whether <clears throat> sort of organized and, and uh, created by agents of change or the accidental kind of disaster that, uh, that we, we experienced, opportunities that can be exploited pretty ruthlessly. Um, and we were warned by Naomi Klein, and it was a, a brilliant, fascinating uh, writer, not somebody whose every perception about New Orleans turned out to be correct, but she was early in the game, warning us that, you know, we're going to be taken over by corporate capital, we're going to be uh, left for dead, our beautiful you know, sort of quaint and lovely city with its street culture is going to be ruined by uh, intrusion. We heard from Donald Trump who was going to come down there and build a high-rise condo tail. 
all of which was a little nerve-wracking but also encouraging. And then all of a sudden there was nothing. Naomi was wrong, really. We didn't see corporate predation coming into our city. We saw absolute torpor economically. And then slowly, and it's a fascinating process as far as I'm concerned, and it's what I've been studying for the last several years, we began to piece ourselves back together both as a, as a city, as a, as a society, um, as, a, as an attitude toward life. And slowly enough, New Orleans has come back. And today, I don't know if you've been over there recently, but it's really quite uh, the parts of the city you'd be likely to visit, uh, the French Quarter, Garden District, and all of that stuff. Um, is probably burnished since Katrina. It's been fixed up. It's been in parts gentrified, which is a, a, a dubious blessing, but a, a welcome economic uh, change. And um, you know that's that's very exciting. We have more restaurants now in New Orleans than we had before Katrina, and yet the population is off by a hundred thousand. You know, go figure. But in the areas that got clobbered for reasons that are disturbing to study and think about, the recovery has not been adequate. And m most, of those, most of those areas were the areas inhabited by poorer New Orleanians, New Orleanians who came late to home ownership, which is to say African-American New Orleanians, uh, and, and whose homes were built in the, the more difficult parts of the city as swampland was reclaimed. The danger that they faced, the sad, the tragedy that has befallen them is that they were victimized twice. They were victimized by the storm, and then they were victimized by a mayoral administration that didn't have the guts or the focus to say, don't rush back here. You know, we need to rethink our city's footprint. If you come back in here, you're going to be putting your money irrecoverably into properties you'll never be able to sell or insure. And now you, and they're going to be surrounded by blight because not everybody's going to follow you back in there. And that's been the sad truth of, uh, for parts of New Orleans. Overall, uh, I would say our recovery is, is astonishing and, and very encouraging, and it, it has factored in things as strange as the Saints Super Bowl, you know, uh, that, that had an enormously galvanizing effect, set back by the BP oil spill, which was very daunting, very fearful and fearsome and, uh, uh, you know, a, a cause for terrible concern that we would wind up essentially killing off our entire, uh, well, not only our oil services industries, but our fisheries, which are the most productive in the, in the continent. Well, that's a perfect segue into another topic we, c we should touch on, at least briefly. Tell us about your involvement with the National Oil Spill Commission and uh, some general thoughts you have about it. Well, I was tapped um, as a sort of an instant expert on, in the way that journalists are, uh, instant expert on, a, on the disaster we had just undergone to do some work as a senior consultant to the National Oil Spill Commission, which f for, for those in your audience who are not familiar with it, was run actually by former Florida Senator Bob Graham, the Democrat, and uh, William Riley, who had been a Bush one head of the EPA. So bring some balance, some political uh, transparency to the discussion. And I'm not a scientist, I'm not an expert on, on the technologies that failed in the BP disaster, but I was able to bring some sort of social context to the, to the report's understanding of our culture of, of oil in Louisiana and simultaneously fishing and the way they have always interacted. There was a false portrayal of our fishing communities as the hopeless victims of this, of this high-tech disaster, which in some respects they were, but they were also part of it. They were also, uh, historically, you'd, you'd fish in one season and you'd service rigs in another. So they were as much a part of this industry as they were victims of it. And that was very, uh, a, an interesting um, discovery. And uh, it was a, a, a part of my life that I, I don't at all regret boning up on that disaster, learning about it, learning how we could do better next time. That, because uh, one of those rigs is gonna blow again. I don't think there's much question. Hopefully the response will be more intelligent and more uh, efficacious. And uh, the, f the report's final message was that we need to, to stage the kind of cleanup equipment and the, as well as the regulatory apparatus to keep these things from happening as much as possible, but then to be prepared when they do so that uh, we don't see 
tars wash, washing up on beaches. We don't have to worry about the entire west coast of Florida becoming a parking lot, as it might well have by some of the early prognostications. Now, you've had an opportunity to analyze disasters in different cultural contexts. Um, how does response preparedness and so forth vary from country to country, culture to culture? Or are there principles and approaches that work equally well? Well, one of the most interesting contrasts that I've been exposed to, I, I, I went into Cuba um, a couple of times, actually, um, in a kind of hands across the sea exchange of ideas, New Orleanians, and then the Cuban emergency infrastructure, civil defense. And we came to understand, you know, with very limited, um, you know, infrastructure, how Cuba approaches storm mitigation ahead of time, sort of, you know, lifting whole communities up into the mountains and taking the refrigerator out of the house and carrying it up the hill. Um, you know, it's it's the Cuban model, which is to say, it's uh, it's coercive of community engagement at that level, but an interesting, an interesting approach, one that simply cannot be adapted directly to the American model, um, the American political realities, and we can be thankful for that. But um, there were a lot of lessons, like the need, for example, to prepare, to mandate that all of our gas stations have generators, because one of the first things that disappeared, to everybody's surprise and horror after Katrina, was the ability to fuel your car. And the reason that you couldn't fuel your car was not because there wasn't gas in the stations, it was because they didn't have the power to pump it out. And those seemingly simple but nonetheless pivotal kinds of shortcomings were you know, lessons that we were able to uh, absorb in the, in the otherwise um, unrecognizably different Cuban context. Now, is disasterology the subject of your next work, or? Am I getting too far ahead of the discussion? Well, I am working on a book, and I'm hoping it's not a book about a disaster. It's a book about my family, mm -hmm. and uh, we will seek to uh, prevent it from becoming a disaster. But no, I, I, have, uh, I have done actually a book since Katrina. I've done actually two. One was a, 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 a coffee table book about the disaster with photographs and text that I, I didn't take the photographs, I did the text. And then in collaboration with a very controversial figure, um, Ed Blakely, who was brought in as the recovery czar for New Orleans, with other disasterologists from around the world, including Australians and Europeans and sundry others, we put together a, a manual on sort of disaster recovery strategies. The feeling being that everybody knows about disasters, but we don't, that, that the recovery phase is a is a really a new, a new thing. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Mr. Horn. Well, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. And thank you. For Global Perspectives, I'm John Bercia. We'll see you next time. This program is made possible, in part, by funding from the UCF Global Perspectives Office, the Global Connections Foundation, and the India Center at UCF.